Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, it's the 16th of January, 2023. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So first up, we have a quick update on Ethereum withdrawals, very quick, not no any major changes here. This update comes from Greg Vardy, who is the CTO at Nethermind. He said, there was a small change in the withdrawals format, hence there will be one more devnet called Withdrawal Devnet 3, and the public testnet is still targeted for next week, uh, next week being this week. So we should see this public test net uh, up and running soon. I believe this is the one, uh, th this is kind of the... Um the Shanghai public test net that is being spun up uh, anew. Uh, so it's not the existing ones being forked over with Shanghai, like um, uh, Girlie and Sepolia. It is a just a new test net that people can join if they want to, being spun up to test the Shanghai withdrawals upgrade. Uh, sorry, the Shanghai upgrade here, which is basically just withdrawals at this point. But yeah, just wanted to give that quick update there for you guys. Now, moving on to, I think what something was the biggest thing that happened over the weekend was that the KZG ceremony uh, went live. So a lot of you have already participated in this at ceremony.ethereum.org. But uh, the TLDR, just for those who may not be aware, the KZG ceremony is a requirement for us to get EIP 4844 onto the network. Uh, and there's an FAQ at the bottom of the main page here, which actually explains all about this and why it's required, how it works and all that good stuff there. But basically, uh, if you want to contribute, you can go to the ceremony.ethereum.org website here. Uh, you can contribute via this UI or you can use the IPSF, IPFS interface or there's other clients and these kind of links here will get you to those. But participating is very, very easy. You basically click, click begin, you move your mouse around a bunch of times, you input your own kind of like random bunch of characters and letters, whatever you want to do, and you sign uh, the transactions with your wallet. Uh, make sure the wallet that you're using is a public wallet if you're going to advertise that you participate in the ceremony because it does say to you at the end, hey, do you want to share this to Twitter? Make sure it's a public wallet if you want to do that so that you don't dox yourself or anything like that. Uh, then the contribution uh, is done basically. Now, there has been a bunch of questions around uh, wait time. So there is a, a wait time here. It's not like you... It, it'll just happen instantly for you. Uh, and Mario's here from the uh, Geth team put an, at an FYI saying the estimation for the wait time is very uh, inaccurate on the KZG ceremony website, which you can actually see up here. There's an estimated wait time at the top of the page. Uh, the wait time is calculated as a worst case scenario with the maximum timeout per submission. In reality, most submissions are done in 30 seconds and it actually happens randomly. So this is not a queue here. You, it's not like you go into a queue once you uh, begin the process or once you uh, finalize the process or in, in, the, in the process of waiting there. It is randomly, you are randomly picked out of all the other ones that are currently, I guess, like in the queue, so to speak, right? It's not like uh, you'll lose your spot if you get out of it, if you have to restart the process or something like that. Uh, it's basically just chosen at random here. Now, just looking at some early stats, it's only been live for two to three days, and we're already at almost 5,500 total contributions, which is awesome to see. I know I said before that I would love to see tens of thousands of contributions, which I think is going to be pretty easily reached here, uh, but hopefully we get to 100,000 plus. Uh, and also on that note as well, the uh, ceremony runs for another 56 days from time of recording. So you have plenty of time to participate. There's no uh, uh, reason for you to participate today if you don't want to. You, and, and if you want to kind of get it done um, uh, in an environment that uh, seems to, like when all the bugs are ironed out, because there has been small bugs here and there, you can wait for that. You don't have to do it today. So you do have 56 days to do it. And you can do it multiple times from multiple different Ethereum wallets as well. Which brings me to my next point, which is that I find it funny because I think there is a little bit of airdrop farming going on here which doesn't really make sense to me because there is no airdrop happening here in terms of getting a token or anything like that because there is no token associated with this. This is a uh, part of an upgrade that's going into the core Ethereum protocol. The Ethereum Foundation is not going to do an airdrop or anything to participants in this ceremony and uh, there's not going to be an airdrop done by the ceremony themselves. If another project decides to airdrop a token to ceremony participants, that's on them. But I feel like the chances of that are quite low. Uh, as far as I know, there isn't a pop for uh, uh, participating either. So you're not going to get that if you participate. Uh, at least maybe there is one out there. I just haven't come across it. Uh, and there also isn't other isn't any other NFTs that are going to get airdropped to you or anything like that. So if you're trying to farm an airdrop here, I don't suggest doing that. Uh, but the funny thing is, ironically enough, it's not actually a bad thing that people are doing that because it's still generating some kind of randomness. Unless that person is being malicious and they're just submitting things that aren't actually random, it's all the same, which would be quite an effort to do just to get, you know, just to 
both farm for an airdrop and to basically cyber attack the process, which I, I think is a low chance of happening as well. But there is that possibility. Now, the, the reason why we want as many participants as possible in the KZG ceremony, or at least one of the main reasons, is so that we can be sure that we have uh, covered all our bases, so to speak. Because as, as I've described before, we only need one honest participant for the ceremony to be secured, just one. Now, in saying that, there is a caveat there in that if the software that's being used as part of the ceremony is uh, compromised in any way or has a bug in it or in any way that leaks the the leaks the privacy and basically makes it not not private anymore then that could also be an issue but if let's assume that everything's fine there's no bugs uh, there's no um, uh, kind of issues with the software itself well then it really only requires one person to be honest and the fun thing about that is that I contributed to the ceremony and I know that I was honest I didn't try to do any funny business here I know that the, the um, the, the, the randomness that I generated. I didn't actually save it either. I just literally typed in a bunch of words, a bunch of characters. I did my mouse on the screen randomly. And then it also uses some stuff in the background of your browser to generate more randomness. Uh, and I didn't try to fool it. So I know I can have 100% confidence because I trust myself, obviously, that, um, I, that, that I am the only honest participant in the whole scheme. Even if there are 100,000 participants and I'm the only one, that still means that I have 100% certainty that it's secure assuming that there's no bugs in the software or anything like that, right? Like that's the just assumption that I'm making here because obviously if you don't assume that there is never 100% certainty, uh, but I can have that. And so can you, if you have acted honestly, you can also have that certainty, which is a really cool thing about this Um about this ceremony is that it's a called a trusted setup, which some people may uh, kind of uh, read into that and say, oh, it's a trusted setup, it's not trustless. But in reality, you only have to trust, it's a one of kind of N trust assumption, right? You only have to trust that one participant out of the ho hopefully tens of thousands uh, has been honest. And, and then you can go from there, which I think is really, really cool. I love how this works. And this is the biggest, uh, I, I believe, um, KZG ceremony ever and the, and the biggest, um, uh, maybe one one of the biggest privacy ceremonies ever, uh, but yeah, I'm not sure on that one. I have to kind of look. I have seen some tweets about it, but I haven't got them handy for me. But yeah, if you want to contribute, you've got 56 days to do so, and you can go to ceremony.ethereum.org to do that. There is also a explanation thread here from Chris, who works at Scroll, uh, diving into the KZG ceremony. So if you want to learn more about it from a, a more technical layer as well, you can read this thread from Chris, which I'll link in the YouTube description below. But as I said, there is also an FAQ on the bottom of the page here on the bottom of the main page that you can check out and there's documentation linked at the bottom with the audit report and the github repository too so it's all there it's all available for you and it's also available for you to contribute uh right now or just after watching this video or listening to the podcast all right, so a massive announcement out of MetaMask over the weekend. They have integrated staking directly into the MetaMask wallet extension. So you can see here that if you go to portfolio.metamask.io slash stake, uh, you can now stake with both Lido and Rockapool through the portfolio dApp. Okay, so this isn't part of the extension, sorry. This is just on the portfolio dApp, which obviously will, will um, seamlessly link into your MetaMask extension or mobile wallet or whatever else you've got there. But very cool to see MetaMask supporting this because they also have, an interface here uh, where you can sort by different metrics. So you can sort by rewards, which is the default that it's being sorted by here. And you can see the rewards of both Lido and Rockapool. Now, the way this works is basically that you buy STETH or RETH. Um, you're not actually staking with any of these uh, providers. You're just buying the STETH on the open market or the RETH on the open market. And and they've also got, a, 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 in, in the sorting here, you can also sort by uh, different um, uh, different things, not just by rewards, but I believe you can sort by, I guess, like stake on the network. So it'll actually tell you, hey, you know, Lido has a lot of uh, share of the network already. It's recommended that you, that you stake with Rockapool because they have a lower share of the network. So I, I really like how they did that. I, I like how they did that for two reasons. One, uh, it shows that they're actually committed to uh, educating users on different aspects of staking. And uh, two, these rewards APRs can be misleading at times. And I'm not just saying that because I want Rockapool to get more growth on Lido at this point, obviously, because Lido already has the, almost 30% of the network. Rockapool only has around 2.2%. I would love to see Rockapool grow more. But the reason I'm saying this is because I see these rewards um, percentages get thrown around a lot. They can be highly volatile because the rewards are made up of three different things, right? 
And that percentage is calculated based on three different things from the protocol itself. It's calculated based on the consensus layer reward, which is the issuance, the, and the execution layer rewards, which are the tips, so the unburned fee revenue, and the ME, any potential MEV that you would get from participating in MEV boost, which Lido and Rockapool operators already do. So you would a default get... Um, get exposure to that. But on top of that, there's also a lot of other things that play into this, like how effective the Lido and Rocket Pool operators are, what fee they take on, uh, you know, what commission they take and what commission the, the mini pools take, what commission the Lido operators take, right? Uh, how, how, and not only how effective they are at their just normal validator duties, but how lucky they are potentially with MEV opportunities and how many MEV opportunities they get. And that can influence, especially over shorter and medium term uh, timeframes, the APR here. So the way I like to look at it, I like to look at the, pretty much the year. I like to look at a full 12 months. Now that's hard to do a lot of the time because I believe maybe Rocket Pool isn't even at 12 months yet of being live on mainnet. I'm not entirely sure there. I, I don't think so. I don't remember them being live for, for, for 12 months there. Uh, Lido definitely is. But in terms of, I guess, uh, the MEV side of it as well and, and the uh, execution layer rewards in general, they're quite volatile too. Because if you take like a year, then there are going to be parts in that year where demand spikes. Like we just saw over the last week that demand spiked a lot, right? So that's going to influence the APR as well. So if, you look, if you're looking at shorter, medium term time frame, it can also influence this APR. So that's why there are usually estimates given here as to what the APR that you can expect uh, will be. Uh, but I think that uh, the estimates themselves can be quite wild at times because there were estimates given out during the bull market that assumed like a 10% plus APR because they were basing it on those gas fees remaining as high as they were, right? And the MEV opportunities remaining high because of that. Now, we've been in a bear market. The APR comes down because network activity is relatively low. And that means MEV opportunities are relatively low and obviously fees as well. So it's it can become highly volatile. So I wouldn't just look at these numbers and take them as gospel. Uh, because if you say, if you, if you look at this and you go, okay, I'm going to buy STF today. And then I'm going to get 5.22% rewards on my ETH basically forever. That's not how it works at all. These rewards are probably going to go down. Uh, I mean, they definitely go down as more ETH is staked. Uh, uh, and if the and they, and the the only way they can really go up is if less ETH is stake, which I don't imagine happening, or if MEV and and the tip revenue goes up, which again only really happens when network activity comes back, when demand comes back, and can be highly volatile because it's based on speculative activity. So even though I think it's really cool that MetaMask has has done this and integrated this, I would just caution against taking these numbers at face value because they're definitely just estimates uh, at the end of the day. And maybe they should actually say that on the interface here, say that estimated rewards instead of the actual percentage, because I think that's a little bit misleading there. Maybe they have updated that. I haven't checked that. I'm just going off the screenshots, but it would be cool for them to do that as well. But anyway, cool to see MetaMask supporting Ethereum staking here uh, and supporting Lido and Rocket Pool, not just, uh, not just Lido, which is pretty cool to see. All right. So speaking of staking, Terence from the Pry Labs team put out a tweet saying that we have now reached 500,000 validators on the Ethereum proof of stake chain. And you can see here that it, at time of screenshot, it was about 500,275 to be exact. And staked ETH was at about 16 million and, and really has just been continuing to go up as we approach withdrawals here, which I find pretty funny. And as I said before, in 2022, we basically almost doubled the amount of validators on the network. So it doesn't really seem people are uh, eager to, you know, hold off to withdraw or to wait for, uh, uh, sorry, to, when withdrawals happen, are, uh, are eager to like pull their stake. As I've said before, and as I explained, I think it was last week or the week before, I expect a lot more ETH to be staked post withdrawals than, than withdraw, but obviously the rewards and, and the actual, uh, sorry, the consensus layer rewards uh, is different to the actual staked ETH. And, and I expect a lot of the consensus layer rewards to definitely be uh, withdrawn and potentially sold for tax purposes and all of that. But I think that's all noise in the grand scheme of things. Uh, but great to see 500,000 validators live here. As I've explained before, this doesn't mean there's 500,000 unique people running validators on the network. That's not how it works at all. You can run many validators off of one full node. So the better way to measure, I guess, like decentralization would be to look at the full nodes. And right now, at time of recording, I believe it's around 8,600 full nodes on the Ethereum network, which is pretty good, right? Like it's a, a, And they're very distributed across the globe. They're not just all in the US, they're very distributed uh, across the in, entire globe. And not only that, but the validators are also quite distributed too, which is great to see. MEV uh, is getting a lot better. We have a, a much more, I guess, um, 
much more diverse MEV ecosystem, which is something that I was looking at the other day, which I might bring up here because I think it's interesting to talk about this in uh, in the context of staking here. So the MEV, I guess, uh, watch.info website that I talk about a lot has stuck, has basically stuck at around 64% of all blocks still enforcing OFAC compliance. But this doesn't tell the whole story. If we untick include all blocks and we look at the relayers, the uncensoring relayers are actually becoming more diverse here. So you remember that blocks route max profit was very dominant, right? It was at like almost 20%. Uh, and now it's at 15% of uh, MEV uh, boost blocks. And we can see that uh, Agnostic Boost, which is run by Gnosis, is almost at 8% now of MEV boosted blocks. And then Ultrasound Money Relay is at 4.2%. So these other non-censoring relayers are, are growing really, really nicely, uh, which is really great to see, right? It's great to see that there's diversity in there. And Flashbots' market share has also come down a lot, obviously, as well. So that's, that's improving greatly. And it shows that the decentralization of not only this, the validators, but also the people running uh, uh, MEV relay, MEV boost relayers is also distributing too. So great to see this uh, and great to see that half a million validators are now live on the proof of stake chain. All right, so speaking of staking, uh, I think this is the last thing I have to, to say about staking. Uh, this is a tweet thread here from Marsor who said, liquid staking has an unbelievable set of tailwinds behind it. This isn't an overhyped trade, but instead a growing cornerstone of the ETH economy. A few thoughts. So I, I, I highly recommend giving this thread a read. I'm not gonna go over it myself, but I do wanna focus on uh, something that I have basically talked about before with regards to these, I guess, like liquid staking tokens and the, I guess, ratio between them and how I believe that there isn't going to be a one player a kind of wins all. And it hasn't really played out like that either. I mean, I know Lido is a pretty dominant market. I know Lido has a pretty dominant market over not just all Ethereum, ETH that's staked, but the um, ETH that's staked as part of LSDs. But I think that is, is temporary. I think the amount of competition that is coming and the amount of competition that is here already, and then with withdrawals in, in implemented, we can see that great reshuffling of stake. I really do agree with Marsor here, where he says, you know, this liquid staking has all these tailwinds behind it. Uh, I think that's going to definitely be the case. And then in the thread, he also points out that, you know, there, there are things that can also contribute to this, like being able to stake from hardware like this, right? Like a, basically a Rock 5 B board or a Raspberry Pi uh, and being able to do this by, and being able to run a mini pool with even less ETH in the future. Like as I've talked about before, there are these LEB upgrades coming to mini pools. First, it's going to be eight and then it's going to be four. So you only need, instead of 16 ETH and some RPL to spin up a mini pool, you only need eight ETH and some RPL. And then you will need four ETH and some RPL. And then maybe one day only two ETH and some RPL. So bringing down that barrier to entry will obviously improve this a lot as well. And that obviously directly affects the LSD market share because it can only be done through Rocker Pool, right? And then when we have other services coming online like Stakewise V3 that allow solo stakers to essentially uh, still be a solo stake up at issue and LSD against it. So I expect that to lead to a lot of growth as well uh, because there's a lot of solo stakers today that may be like, okay, well, I really want to have access to my ETH uh, when I'm staking it, but I, as a solo staker, I don't get an LSD. So I'm going to restake it with stakewise and still be able to be a solo staker, but with an LSD uh, minted against it, which I think obviously is very cool. But anyway, you can go give this thread from Marsor a read yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, so speaking of demand drivers generally and how that affects, uh, I guess, like not only fear of a new fall, the Ethereum network, but also the amount of ETH that is burned, today or yesterday, we got back to being in ultrasound territory. Now, you can see that we are just barely in there right now since the merge. The supply change is 1.18 ETH, which if I keep watching this screen, it's probably going to go uh, positive because we're not above the ultrasound barrier right now. But I mean... I always come back to the fact that I think this is quite negligible. Now, it's been four months since the merge or around four months since the merge. Whether it's like negative, like truly negative or a few thousand ETH issued since the merge is kind of irrelevant because when you click this little button here called simulate proof of work, this will show you what the net issuance of ETH would have been if Ethereum was still on proof of work. So this is only four months worth of issuance, guys, since Ethereum got off proof of work. It would have been 1.45 million ETH, right? So if you're talking about us issuing, net issuing a few thousand ETH or maybe a few thousand negative ETH, it doesn't really matter, right? Maybe it matters a little bit for the meme, for the ultrasound money meme. Maybe we get to uh, we get to have um, a celebration about it whenever it happens. But in the grand scheme of things, 
what the whole point of, uh, I guess, like ultrasound money in general is, is not necessarily to have the ETH issuance be negative all the time. It's to have the ETH issuance be low enough, right, that it is practically zero while still securing the network. That's how I view it anyway. So whenever people go on about, oh, we're almost ultrasound, I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. It's it's cool. You know, it's a good meme, whatever. But like, I don't think that really has any real bearing on anything it's, and certainly not on price. I think we've already done that job, whether the, the net issuance is that few thousands or or even tens of thousands because of the fact that we are perpetually not going to issue a shit ton amount of ETH that would have otherwise been issued. And you can see it even more on this chart here that basically shows the ETH supply uh, under proof of work, which would have been 3.57% a year. Then it shows Bitcoin's current supply, which is 1.7%. And then proof of stake's current supply, which is obviously 0% right now because we're in negative territory. But even when that goes positive, it's like 0.001%. It is negligible. It is literally a rounding error. So I wouldn't over-index too much on that. Um, but I do like whenever this happens, the Bitcoin maximalists get really triggered over this and they start giving us more free marketing. And they start saying that ETH isn't, isn't sound money because it can change its monetary policy and all this other stuff. And it's like, guys, like, that doesn't matter to us. Like we really don't care. It's a meme. Uh, it, you know, we, we think ETH is an, an amazing asset. We think ETH is going to to outperform Bitcoin over time. That's why we hold ETH, right? I mean, I'm, I guess I should speak for myself here. I know some of you still hold Bitcoin, you heathens. No, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. But just generally, I love just seeing that uh, on, on Twitter because it just makes me laugh. It's like, guys, you can literally just ignore Ethereum. If you thought, if you think Ethereum is so useless, just ignore it, right? But anyway, that's a, a little bit of a, a guilty pleasure of mine there. But still, I guess, uh, great to see that we're back in uh, ultrasound territory, if only just, and if only for a little bit, because I mean, the ultrasound barrier is not going to maintain unless the demand maintains, which which can kind of happen because we've had some nice price action over the last couple of weeks for sure. I mean, no one's going to doubt that, but it could be one of those bull traps that everyone kind of fears, or it could just be a flash in the pan. And, you know, we, we don't know, right? We don't know where it goes from here. But as I explained the other day, the demand on the Ethereum network is slowly becoming more sustainable and, and less prone to just demand spikes to maintain that ultrasound barrier. So if we can do that, awesome, right? If we can do that sustainably over many months and potentially years, I'm all for that. That's the whole point of what we're building, right? That And and, and the fact that if we can maintain above the ultrasound barrier based on sustainable demand, it means that we're always going to be deflationary. And that's that's great as well, right? It's a great little bonus to have from, from that there. But yeah, I guess like happy ultrasound money day again, guys. But as I said, don't over-index on this too much. The real effects was the fact that we're basically hanging around zero issuance anyway. And the fact that we did the merge, we which greatly reduced issuance, not only in general, but it reduced issuance going to miners who we know sold most of it, especially when uh, the market was trending up, uh, they were taking profits into it, which uh, led to a probably definitely, I believe, weaker ETH price overall. So yeah. All right, so moving on. So David Schwartz from the Polygon Hermes team is quote tweeting this thread here from Effort Capital who said, ZK EVMs will, will see no meaningful adoption in 2023. There I said it and here is why. His thread itself is pretty bad, honestly. Like I read through it and it's not even very long and I'm like, okay, I don't really think your thread... Uh, I mean, there, there is one good point in there, but most of it is kind of bad. The one good point that he brings up is, is he says that most people thought that uh, optimistic roll-up adoption was going to be a lot more than what it was in 2021 and 2022. But to be fair, they didn't really go live in like a public fashion until the end-ish of 2021, like Q3, Q4. And then 2022, they actually did see a fair bit of growth, right? But then what I wanted to focus on was uh, David Schwartz's tweet where he basically says, in 2021, people were saying ZK AVMs are impossible. In 2022, people were saying ZK AVMs would not be practical because of proving costs. And now in 2023, the narrative has changed to talking about adoption in general. So it's kind of funny how within a couple of years, we went from ZK AVMs being impossible to now talking about when adoption is going to happen for ZK AVMs, which I love because that's a very big narrative change. And it, re it really is positive for the ecosystem generally. Where I sit on this is that we're still in January, guys. Like we're like halfway through January right now and the ZK VMs aren't live yet. They're going to go live over the next few months. Definitely a lot of them are going to be live within the first half of this year. I expect them to get a fair bit of traction. I don't expect them to get like an explosive amount of traction, especially not if the market is still generally quiet, but I still expect them to see at least some sort of meaningful adoption this year. If, if they launch in the first half of this year, if they launch in the second half, it'll be a bit harder. But does it actually even matter? 
Do, like, why, why would why does it even matter, right? If it happens this year or next year, why does it matter? All that matters is that they get they get deployed and then people use them and then there's growth there and then there's growth for the optimistic wallops as well, which there has been and growth for layer twos in general and money going into it and people joining the layer two space. That's what matters. It doesn't matter that we don't, you know, launch a ZKVM and then it instantly becomes top of the TVL charts. That's that's not that's not signal to me. That that that's noise. That that I would actually be very skeptical of that because it'd be like, you know, why are people all of a sudden depositing all this money into a brand new ZKVM, right? So you need to look at it from the things that I've discussed before, where you don't just look at TVL, you look at all these other metrics around it. And you also need to look at the, the, kind of what state they're in. Are these ZKVMs in a state where they actually have a cap on how much money can be put into them? Well, that's obviously going to affect adoption, right? So taking all that into account, I think is a very good way of, of going about it. Uh, but then also realizing that the narrative has changed drastically over the last two years can maybe help you plan for the next two years. Just look at th some things people are doubting today, especially in the Ethereum ecosystem, and then uh, kind of extrapolate that out and g give a percentage chance as to what it'll be like in a couple of years. Uh, one, one big thing that I think people are potentially discounting today with Ethereum is and uh, the, the L2 space is the fragmentation of liquidity, which was a bigger narrative, I guess, last year and the year before, but I think has kind of subsided a lot because of the bridges. But now the the, the narrative has kind of shifted to the user experience. They're like, oh no, users aren't going to want to jump through all these different L2 hoops. It's like, just wait, guys. Like They're not going to feel like they're jumping through hoops. It's going to be all abstracted away from them. It's going to be totally fine. I know it's a meme to say we're still early, but we are. You can't expect these things to be well-oiled machines. You can't expect them to be on the same level as apps that exist on the internet today because we're still building the core infrastructure. We're not only building the apps and the front ends and things like that, right? We're building the back end still. We're building the core infrastructure that all this stuff gets deployed on and that's going to take time there. All right, so speaking of layer twos, Arbitrum announced that the Norwegian government is testing a cap table platform on the Arbitrum One network. So this is very cool here. So you can see here that uh, in this blog post, you can see how Norway is using Arbitrum for shareholder management. Uh, and basically the TLDR is that the Norwegian government has announced the development of something called Brock, a cap tables platform for unlisted companies on the public Ethereum network. With Brock, you can easily share and update your company's uh, shareholder information using blockchain technology, making the process faster, more efficient, and more secure. What did I say the other day, guys? We're going to see more and more of these real-world assets coming on to Ethereum, right? And real-world asset management coming on to Ethereum. Well, here's just one example of this happening and one example of how this makes Ethereum more legitimate because it, people will look at this and be like, wow, the Norwegian government is not only using Ethereum, but they are using a layer two built on Ethereum. We should look into this. Like if the Norwegian government is putting their, their, um, their uh, I guess, like power behind this or weight behind this, this is interesting. This, this adds legitimacy to Ethereum. It adds legitimacy to Arbitrum and layer twos more broadly. So so, I, you know, as I said the other day when I was talking about real world assets, we're going to see more and more of this happen. We're going to see more and more of this happen from these large existing institutions and corporations because they control all of the real world assets, right? They, they manage them. They they steward them and they're going to be looking at ways to, to do that in a more efficient way and be able to plug into this emerging financial system that we have on Ethereum. And it's just great to see the Norwegian government being so progressive here by doing this. Uh, kudos to them for that. And I can't wait to see uh, more updates about this as time goes on. All right, so speaking of layer twos, Polynar had a great tweet over the weekend where they said, I know that professional researchers and developers greatly prefer rollups, but I've now changed my mind. I think well-designed app-specific validiums and optimistic chains make the most sense for most low-value, high-throughput use cases. Financial applications still need rollups. Now, I've discussed this before on the refuel, but I strongly agree with Polynar here. There is no need to put your game assets on something like a rollup that is going to be much more expensive for you than something like a Validium, which outsources the data availability to a data availability committee, right? So low value assets should definitely be, uh, not, should not be deployed to rollups, at least not in their current state, and maybe not even post EIP 4844, depending on transaction costs. Maybe one day they will, but for now, Validiums and optimistic chains make much more sense. Sometimes people will bring up, well, you know, data availability committees aren't very secure. 
Yes, they're better than, I guess, centralized uh, sidechains or sidechains in general. Yes, they're better than Altel ones, but they still have that centralization vector there. And to that, I'll say yes, but that is going to get dramatically better over time with solutions like Eigenlayer, where Ethereum stakers can restake their ETH to a data availability committee, right, and be part of one, and then be able to have a more distributed and more decentralized committee that can service not only one Validium or one optimistic chain, but multiple ones, where and it's basically became, becomes a data availability chain. So that's going to get better over time. And this again goes back to more of a high level overview that I have on Ethereum where I love that the Ethereum core protocol is not trying to do everything itself. It is outsourcing so many of its functions to higher layers, such as these rollups, such as these Validium, such as things like Eigenlayer. And that leads to a much better, much more diverse, distributed and decentralized ecosystem than if Ethereum tried to do everything at layer one. And that's another reason why I'm uber bearish on the monolithic blockchain thesis, because I do not believe that doing everything at layer one uh, leads itself to a sustainable and scalable ecosystem from every single angle you look at it everything economic social uh technology wise i i just you know decentralization wise i truly do not believe that you can get that same uh, level of all those kind of angles on a monolithic chain as you can with a modular chain like ethereum because of the reasons i've outlined in the past but yeah i mean that's more of i guess high level um point here but back to Polynar's tweet I, I fully agree with this financial apps will be able to to be on rollups and will be fine on rollups because people are happy paying you know a one dollar I mean let's just say the fee is a dollar for a swap people are happy paying that right because they're swapping uh, but maybe they're buying an asset because they expect it to go up in value they're obviously expecting to make more than a dollar in profit from it so the gas fee is just the cost of doing business but if you're playing a game or you're trading low value assets that are worth like 10 cents, you're not going to be happy paying a dollar fee for that, right? You automatically have lost 90 cents uh, of your value there. And not to mention the fees that potentially the marketplaces charge, right? So obviously it makes a lot of sense for those fees to be as low as possible and you can get them to ex to an extreme amount of um uh, extreme cheap, extremely cheap, I should say, with Validiums and optimistic chains. Uh, basically, I think it's zero point triple zero, quadruple zero, uh, one cents or something like that. So yeah, they make a lot more spent, uh, a lot more sense there uh, because those low value use cases do not need Ethereum's full security. And I, I've said this a lot of times, but I, I just wanted to reiterate it there because Polly now got my brain jogging with this tweet. All right, last up here to finish us off for today, we have another great tweet thread from Tim Robinson all about how DeFi is following the AWS playbook to take over finance. Now, I highly recommend going and giving the thread a read for yourself. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But the TLDR is basically that the reason why AWS won as a, I guess, like hosting infrastructure is that it did everything for the user. It had all these building blocks that the user could interact with. It had them available for them. It had them all in the, in the same place and people could modularize, modularize them, right? right? Could, could use them. They didn't have to use everything. They didn't have to worry about keeping their servers up, their configurations. There was plug and play, like Lego bricks, basically, that they could play with. What does that sound like? DeFi. It's the same kind of thing, right? It's that same kind of thing of the DeFi backends, DeFi uh, Lego blocks that you can play with, and you can stick them all together, do whatever you want with it, build your own app on it, and and it's all there for you without you having to mess around and, and bootstrap it yourself and build it yourself and waste all this manpower and all this uh, time doing that. So, so yeah, that's the TLDR. But again, highly recommend giving this thread a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. But on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give that video a thumbs up subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.